This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Thank you for tuning in to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast, where we discuss the latest and greatest news in the world of sports. As always, I'm Alex. Today is Tuesday. It is September 13th. I am without Ben today, Tuesday and Thursday. Don't forget, but he'll be back tomorrow. We'll preview a lot of good action coming in this week, college football, baseball, some regular football in terms of the NFL, but... Today is Tuesday, which means there was Monday Night Football last night, and ten, well, this week, as opposed to other weeks, that meant there was two games. Yeah, there was two games on Monday night to, to end the kickoff week in the NFL. The first being the Pittsburgh Steelers facing off on the road against the Washington Redskins. And the second being uh, the L.A. Rams in their first game of the regular season back as L.A. since 1994, facing off against division rival San Francisco. So I'm going to get into those games. I'm going to recap the action. Then I'm going to hit some news related to the NFL and color rush of the issue somewhat last year for the NFL. For those who are colorblind, had trouble Telling the difference between the jerseys. They think to have had a breakthrough in that aspect and a, excuse me, a decision that will help that. And we'll finish it off with some baseball news. Let's start with the first of the two Monday night games last night, and that is the Pittsburgh Steelers against the home Washington Redskins. The Steelers came out on top 38 to 16. It was a slow start for both teams involved. Through the end of the first qu- uh, yeah, quarter, it was 0-6 to six in favor of Washington. The Steelers' offense was not clicking in the first quarter, but neither was the Redskins. They stalled two drives in the red zone. Kirk Cousins looked a little inaccurate to start. Almost throwing a pick there in the first quarter, if not the beginning in the second quarter, to Steelers cornerback Ross Cockrell. Cockrell excuse me. Um, it was a option route. It was third and three, maybe could have ran it. It was one of those quick passes, and he. It I thought it got tipped because of the how far it went to the corner, and not even really necessarily the receiver, but he threw it that way, and um, I think it kind of caught Cockrell uh, by surprise, and he dropped it. But, that being said, he did throw two interceptions in the game. One to Ryan Shazier there late in the game. Returned for a decent decent amount of yards before a penalty brought them back a little bit. It was a good game to watch. I'll get into why it was the better of the two Monday night games. Uh, Ben Roethlisberger threw for 300 yards and three scores, adding an interception to... Was maybe his fault, was maybe not his fault. Receiver Eli Rogers seemed to fail to come back to the ball where Ben threw it. So write that up as you'd like. I'm sure each will take credit for it. One touchdown pass was just as wacky. On the goal line, getting near halftime there. He threw a strike to Sammy Coates that bounced straight. It went straight past and bounced off. Rashad Breland into Eli Rogers' face, and then he caught it off the rebound. Two touchdown passes other than that one to all-world wide receiver Antonio Brown. Eight receptions, 126 yards, and two touchdowns. Pretty impressive game from him, but it's kind of what you come to expect. Josh Norman was not following him all night, a matchup that a lot of people were looking forward to seeing. Antonio Brown definitely, and the Steelers definitely took 
a lot of uh, it took advantage a lot of the fact that he was not guarded by Norman most of the game, you could say. And they really, as good of a player as Brashawn Breland is, they really took advantage of him over there. He played well on a lot of receivers, but Antonio Brown is just another, he's another level. D'Angelo Williams in relief, I suppose, while he is suspended of Le'Veon Bell for these first three games, again, as Le was last year and did valiantly last year as well, did another solid for the running back. And the veteran ran 26 times for 143 yards and two scores, capping off uh, their last score of the game there late in the fourth. Kind of ice it. It, uh, it, it was nice by him. He showed vision. He showed patience. It was a, definitely a good performance from him in that aspect. Um, the offense, you know, it looked it looked slow to start the the game, but it really got going, and pretty much from the second quarter on, they didn't get stopped often. 14 points, 10 points, 14 points in the second through the fourth quarters. The problem for the Redskins was converting on third down, really getting, you know, moving the ball down the field, really getting opportunities to do so. They scored six in the first. They didn't score again until the third and only put up another three points until a touchdown about halfway through the fourth quarter. Matt Jones only had 24 yards rushing on seven attempts. Chris Thompson did have a touchdown late in the game, but only had 23 yards on four attempts. Deshaun Jackson was a bright spot for the team, 102 yards, excuse me, on six receptions. Jordan Reed seemed to have a decent start to the game, but kind of became quiet at one point. I'm not sure if he was out with an injury. He did come up at one point holding his ankle, kind of limping. You know, he has had injury problems before, especially with his legs. He did have seven receptions for 64 yards. Nobody else really, sh uh, you know, showed up uh, in the game, at least overall. Um, Josh Stockson didn't get his first NFL catch until late, late in the game. One catch for nine yards, rookie out of TCU there. Pierre Garçon, 6 for 51. Vernon Davis only had one catch for 20 yards. He did show uh, skill in the blocking game, something that um, San Francisco 49ers fans are very familiar with from his time there at the team. It was a good game, though. I'll tell you that. It was a very good game. I enjoyed watching this game, and I'll tell you, you know, like I said, we'll get into uh, why this was definitely the... The uh, better game of the Monday night games. Uh, as I said, uh, I meant to mention earlier, Cousins threw two interceptions. The other one was James Harrison in the end zone. For those Steeler fans having flashes of Super Bowl 43 glory in his 100, I would say, I would say personally, 100 and maybe 0.5, maybe one yard return in the Super Bowl there against the Cardinals. <laughs> This time was more of a kind of fall down dive kind of catch. But impressive. The Steelers defense played well. Like I said, the two interceptions there. You had Lawrence Timmons with a, with a team high eight, followed by Ryan Shazier, who was all over the field. He uh, On that interception run back I was telling you about, uh, he did seem to, he hurt his knee a little bit. Some issue he's had with injuries the last few years since being drafted uh, first round out of Ohio State. He has had issues and his knees have hurt. And, and uh, legs have been problems for him. So hopefully that is a problem that can be solved. I know Steeler fans definitely do need him and want him on the field when he's on the field fully healthy. He's a player that is just, man, I can't explain him. He is otherworld like He is faster than receivers. He proved that this offseason when he raced Antonio Brown, Sammy Coates, and Marcus Wheaton and beat all of them in a race. Yeah, he sure know has vision. You know, he missed ta he misses tackles at times, but when he's on, he's on. We saw that against San Francisco 49ers last year when he had, I think, double digit single uh, double digit single tackles. He had a forced fumble, a fumble recovery. He was on it, a couple sacks. You know. Speaking of the San Francisco 49ers, let's move to the second game, the nightcap of the doubleheader in the first week of the NFL season. And that was the San Francisco 49ers hosting the now L.A. Rams. I would like to say I watched, in my life, a more boring football game than this. But I don't know if I can do that and mean it. 
San Francisco came out on top on this one, twenty-eight to nothing. Now, uh, at a at a glance, one would assume the San Francisco 49ers dominated this game, and in a sense, they did. But they didn't dominate it by being a great team. I think this was widely dominated because the Rams were a very bad team last night. Case Keenum had 130 yards passing, two interceptions. Todd Gurley only had 47 yards on the ground on 17 rushes. They could not get anything going. Their offense stalled. They did not look good. You know, they couldn't get the ball over the sticks routinely. You know what I mean? They they just, they couldn't, they couldn't convert. They couldn't do much. Johnny Hecker, their punter, had 10 punts last night for a net yardage of 431 yards. 431 yards on 10 punts. No turnovers for the uh, Rams defense. I believe, actually, I'm sorry, Tremaine Johnson did have one turnover, uh, one turnover recovery. Sean Drawn did fumble the ball earlier in the game, so excuse me for that. He spread the ball out. Uh, Case Keenum, he, he, spread, he spread the ball out a lot to uh, different receivers. Kenny Britt, 4 for 67. Brian Quick, 23 yards on three receptions. Lance Kendrick, 15 yards. Tavon, Tavon Austin, excuse me, 13 if you're getting a if you're getting a uh trend here, it's not really putting the ball downfield. Eight receivers. The most catches by a receiver would be six uh before, excuse me, six, seven yards, like I said, Kenny Britt. Twenty two of those came on one reception though, late in the game. So if you take away that one reception, it's not very pretty. Forty five yards on three receptions would be the league uh, team lead. Now, in relation, Blaine Gabbert didn't play amazing, but he played okay. 170 yards, one touchdown. Carlos Hyde had two scores on 88 yards on the ground. <clears throat> didn't look dominating, but he did have a good game. Blaine Gabbert added 43 yards on the ground. Sean John did have a touchdown run. He only had 18 yards rushing, but one of those rushes of a seven did turn out to be a touchdown, two by, uh, excuse me, one by him, two by Hyde, and then one passing from Gabbert to Vance McDonald. So, new receiver uh, Jeremy Curley led the way, seven receptions, 61 yards. Quentin Patton had a nice kind of second half, five receptions for 60 yards. From there, though, again, two catches, one catch, two, 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 and one. Blaine Gabbert even having one of his own for minus 16 yards and a batted down pass. But after that 60 yards that Quentin Patton put up, the next highest was Sean John with 18. 18 for him. Garrick Selleck, 15 yards. Vance McDonald, 14. Torrey Smith, the quote-unquote number one receiver, two receptions for 13 yards. Carlos Hyde, two for five. This game, if you were if you're a fan of offense... This is not a game for you. By any means, was this a game for you? Now, San Francisco's defense did look good, led by Navarro Bowman. He did look good, as always, in this game. Um, like I said, they did have a couple interceptions. It's just, uh, man, I don't know if I could, if I can really say great job by them or just horrible job by the Rams. You know what I mean? Rookie first-rounder from last year, Eric Armstead, only had one tackle. But rookie first-rounder from this year, DeForest Buckner, had three of his own. So that is nice. Ray Ray Armstrong and Navarro Bowman both had the interceptions for the 49ers. But, man, if I had ever wanted to turn a football game off, it was last night. Now, San Francisco, you know, to be fair to the Rams, who had 10 punts, San Francisco had quite a bit of their own. So I can't let them slip away on that. Uh, Seven punts from their punter, Bradley Pinion. Oh, excuse me, Pinion. Uh, 319 yards in total, as long as 52. So if uh, they're playing by that, the Rams did win that battle, 54 to 52. But uh, And Hecker did land four punts within the 20, only one there for Pinion. But that's not how games are handled. 
The possession was not very far apart, 27-50 for the Rams, 32-10 for the Niners. Total yards, though, 185, 185 excuse me, two, 320. Like I said, the Rams, they, they are, they're, fourth, they're third down, 3 for 15. 3 for 15, that is horrible. I mean, the Niners 8 for 17 isn't amazing, but 3 for 15, I just, I, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't, uh, I can't look at a team like that and think they're going to win any game. 3 for 15, that is, that needs to change. That needs to change in a hurry. They had 10 first downs in the whole game. Whew. Man, if you're a fan of the Niners, congratulations, you got one win. We'll see how many you can add on this year. Not saying you won't, but we'll see where you can go from there. You do play the Seahawks. No, 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 sorry. You play the Panthers next week. Ooh, Seahawks following week. You play the Panthers next week because the Seahawks are playing in the L.A. Rams the f uh, this upcoming week in L.A. Both teams have a lot of work to do. The Panthers, obviously, the NFC defending champions. The Seahawks, always a good team, and they looked eh in their first week. They looked eh, kind of okay in that uh, very low-scoring 12-10 to win over the Miami Dolphins. But, you know, I don't know how well the uh, Rams are going to do against them. You know, luckily they're not playing in CenturyLink, have uh, two really bad back-to-back -back games. But the Rams the last few years have shown they can beat Seahawks. They have the formula to do it. So it'll be interesting Interesting, excuse me, to see where they go from here. Like I said, Panthers this week in Carolina for the Niners. L.A. home game, first time in the regular season since 1940. I'm sorry, 1940, what am I saying? Jeez, 1994. Jeez, 1940. 1994, I think sometime around December, I think it said. So, we'll have to see what happens there for two teams that are now 0-1 and 1-0 in the division. Arizona and, and Los Angeles are at the bottom. Seattle and San Francisco at top. Now, of course, that'll change. Either Seattle or San Francisco will take charge of this. I imagine, well, you know what, Los Angeles can beat Seattle, so... We could have a four-way tie for one-on-one. One. I'm not sure who Arizona plays this week, but wow, wouldn't that be interesting in the most interesting division in football, and I say that sarcastically. Okay, so I'm going to take my first break. We'll come back, and I'll talk some baseball news. How about that? I'll break up the football, and then I'll take my last break and talk that little bit of football related to color rush. So don't go anywhere here at the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast. I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. All right, and we are back here at the Golden State Media Concept Sports Podcast, and we'll get into some MLB news now. As we get down to the really important part of the baseball season, where teams are on the bubble really pushing for the postseason spots, some taking advantage, some not. We have a team that's been good all year, and that is the Chicago Cubs. Last night, their ace, Kyle Hendricks, had a near no-hitter taking it all the way into the ninth inning, as a matter of fact, before being broken up by none other than a home run. Man, that's that's rough. I mean, as a, as a Giants fan, I watched Matt Moore's performance a couple weeks ago against the Dodgers, and he had it going for two outs in the ninth. But I feel like 
one of the hardest ways to give it up is a a home run. I mean, not only do you lose the no-hitter, you lose a shutout all in one. And it was 4 nothing at that point. He got taken out later in the game. And kind of a wacky exchange as well. He uh, they had a mound visit, and then they left because clearly they were trying to get some time to let Aroldis Chapman warm up. They had a mound visit, and then he had to go back. Of course, they have the timer this year. They've always had somewhat of a time. But they, you know, they have the actual, hey, go back to your dugout now. And then they had a mound meeting between the team and such as the catcher was heading out to the mound. He was told, no, 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 get back here because the umpire knew exactly what they were trying to do. Well, Madden walked out there, got in an argument, got himself thrown from the game. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it worked to perfection. Ronald Chapman was ready, warmed up. And closed out the game there in the ninth. For the Chicago Cubs taking the win, like I said, 4-1 over rival St. Louis Cardinals. And I always say, too, as I said, the Giants almost had the no-hitter over the Dodgers. You have the Cardinals almost being no-hit by the Cubs. I feel like it would be better for the team doing so, at least, you know, for fans, and worse for the team being no-hit, if it was, especially if it was your rival. Your main rival. I mean, the Cub, the Cubs and the Cardinals, very big rivals. Obviously, the Dodgers and the Giants, huge rivals. You know, the Red Sox and the Yankees did it. I feel like if you're a fan of the team that's being no hit, and that that is just extra bad. You know what I mean? That is just that. That's just extra. You know, salt in the wound. Even if it's a team like the Giants, no hit the Padres back to back years. You know, that's still a team in the division, a team that you're not obviously a fan of, especially maybe the Padres who have been looked at the last few years as a team that's not very good, although they did beat the Giants last night. I don't know. I feel like that would be that would be tricky. But Hendricks, as I said, he pitched eight innings on his chart. He gave up one hit, one run, one earned run. He gave up two walks, struck out seven in his attempt for a no-hitter. As I said, went all the way into the start of the ninth before giving up a home run. It's a shame. It is. It's a shame. Home run by left fielder Hazel Baker. Sorry, as the font is very small here. <clears throat> and it was no cheapy either, man. He roped that thing. It was a line drive home run, man. Oh, man. He hit that thing out quick. <clears throat> But only person to notch a hit the entire night. Three at-bats, one hit. It was a very good performance by Hendricks, if you look at it that way. If you, just want, if you want to make sure you know. You, you, you find the good in it. And for those who didn't think he was a Cy Young contender, this, uh, I feel like, cements that case. He definitely got the attention of voters last night by going and throwing a one hitter in eight innings I would definitely definitely look at him to get to gain some momentum in the coming weeks I mean that NL wild card has always been a tough you know thing to predict for the most part I mean you have guys who you pretty much feel are going to win it but it's always a quite packed candidate list you know between the bum garners and the Kershaws and the Grankies and such and the Teams maybe not necessarily do the same way. Obviously, Granky and, and Kershaw maybe not going to be up for it this year, but I'm sure you guys get what I mean. All right, let's take our last break. We'll come back. We'll give you the last bit of news, and I will be back tomorrow with my friend Ben to update you on all of the wonderful things that happened tonight in the world of sports. So I will be right back here at the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. 
And we're back here at the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. So I'll give you one more baseball and one more football. So uh, it was announced earlier that the A's have released first baseman D.H. Billy Butler after apparently fighting with teammates in August. I you know that's that's kind of weird to to hear about. I didn't know Billy Butler was the kind of guy to fight with others. Uh, quoted uh, by David Frost, the A's manager, saying it was time to move on. The at bats just weren't there. We wish him the best, but it just never ended up being the great greatest fit here. You know that that could be the case. You know it could be that on top of the fact that apparently he got in fights with people. I don't know if it was. Uh, you know, heated arguments and so on and so forth. But the San Francisco Chronicle did report that the uh, that Butler and teammate Danny Valencia were in a fight earlier this year. Butler made headlines in August when he suffered a concussion in the fight as well. Uh, the Chronicle, like I said, reported that the fight began before batting practice on August 19th over what Butler apparently said to Valencia while an equipment representative was in the clubhouse. Apparently... Butler interrupted Valencia's conversation with the equipment rep to say Valencia's regularly used spikes that are, that are in breach of his contract. Oh, he regularly uses spikes that are in breach of his contract, adding that the rep's company should terminate Valencia's endorsement deal. I don't know what place he had to say that, if that's the case, but that's... Come on, Butler. Apparently, words were exchanged between the two players. Valencia punched Butler in the head during a brief fight. Butler ended up on the seven-day concussion disabled list. Ooh, crazy stuff going on in Oakland. Butler was hitting 276 with four homers and 31 RBIs in 85 games for the team this year. But it just wasn't going quite the right way. And he has been released. Last year he hit 251 with 15 homers and 65 RBIs. So maybe, maybe he can swing a new deal with the team. Maybe going back to the Royals for a team that's uh, definitely, definitely in The playoff hunt, one would say. All right, last bit of news for you today in the world of football, and that is the color rush jerseys. The NFL has announced all of the color rush jerseys for every team as opposed to just the ones we saw last year. I'm not sure I knew this. I thought there was alternates, but the Niners do have that all black and with the red numbers that they showed last year. A lot of the jerseys do look like some of the um, alternates you'll see, excluding they do... Instead of, like, say, Carolina has the Carolina blue jerseys, right? We've seen them wear that before, but they add the pants to it. We have the same Jets and Bills ones from last year. The Eagles are their black alternate home jersey that we have seen before. Obviously, it will be worn with black pants. They do have a green version as well, I believe. The Titans have that Again, kind of Carolina blue that they wear with the pants that match. We saw some new ones unveiled today as well. Uh, the Cowboys are going for that white with blue sleeve, so they'll do white pants with that. The Colts have the blue jerseys that are typical, so that means they'll have the blue pants to it, so that's nice. Two that I really like are the Cardinals ad readapting their black alternate home jerseys, but with a little bit of tweaking to it. Uh, white outline on the numbers. Of course, we'll have black pants with that. Maybe even a black helmet. We did see some teams, I believe, have different helmets. I do really like the Bengals, though. The Bengals have a really cool one. It's all white with black sleeves. Pretty cool looking. It kind of looks funny with the orange helmet because they do have white pants to match. But the jersey is cool looking. Another one I really like are the, the uh, Giants. This is, looks totally 90s Giants. White jersey. Uh, white sleeves all the way down to the very seam. They're really cool looking. I imagine like a white pants with it. And then the Lions are bringing back their black alternate home jerseys that they wore through the mid-2000s. A little bit different to them. The white outline of the numbers. The blue numbers, of course, on the shoulders and the back and front. They're pretty cool. The Ravens might be a little ugly, in my opinion. It depends on how it looks on the field. They're going for their purple, just like their regular home jerseys. But the, blue, the numbers are going to be gold with white outline. And the pants are going to be purple. So to avoid a Barney-looking type deal, they'll go for that. Now, some I don't like. The uh, Seahawks have a it's pretty much their home jersey now, but the color is that that very neon green that they have in their color scheme now. The whole jersey's like that, and the pants are like that too, and it is brutally ugly. 
The Redskins have a very old school looking. It's that yellow that's in there, kind of burnt mustard yellow. They're going to have the jersey and the pants look like that. That's very ugly in my opinion. The Texans have just kind of an adapted version of their home jersey now. The Dolphins have the kind of had an orange jersey like this in the mid 2000s as well. Um, it's kind of more bright now that they have their color change. So they're going to be wearing that all orange as well. And then the Browns have their all orange that we saw last year. The Falcons have a pretty cool one. It's that red that they wore last in the last few years when they wear their kind of throwback reds with black letters and white outlines. That's pretty cool. We saw the heavy-duty yellow of the Rams from last year. The Packers look like they're going just white on white. The Raiders are pretty cool. It looks very AFL Raiders, uh, silver letters, black outline, all white. That's pretty cool. One that I do like a lot as I scroll down is the Patriots. It's very half retro, half current. It's their blue current jersey, but it has the, uh, their I guess, the way you look at them from side to side, they'd be vertical. It's red, white, red stripes going from front shoulder to back shoulder, and that, if that makes any sense. Kind of like those old red jerseys they had as throwbacks. The Vikings, pretty ugly purple with uh, kind of burnt orange or not burnt orange I'm sorry burnt yellow as the letters the Broncos in my opinion not very pretty it's an orange you don't really see them wear and it looks a lot like the Browns in my opinion it looks almost identical to the Browns in that aspect as well um, the Browns have a white stripe with black outlining on it on their shoulders the Broncos do too so that's uh that's a little weird if you ask me. As a Steeler fan, I've been waiting to see the Steelers jerseys, and they are pretty cool. As I said, I've never been a huge fan of the Bumblebee jerseys that they have, but the throwback, not the throwback, the well, yes, that's relevant in a second, but the color rush jerseys that they have this year look just like the throwbacks they had in the late 2000s with the yellow helmets. I'm very excited for that. They're going to be wearing black pants with it. It looks like the regular helmet, but... Man, is it cool looking to me because I have those some of those jerseys. I have a Heinz Ward jersey just like that, and I was hoping it would look like that. Also, the Saints have one more throwback jersey, and it's white, and it's it looks just out of the Archie Manning era. It's pretty cool looking. White, you got the black, then gold, then black, then gold, then black stripe on the outside. Gold numbers, black outline. It is pretty cool looking, man, if you ask me. it is. I would be stoked to wear that if I was a Saints player. If you if you're I mean a fan too, man. I would I'm oh some cool stuff. Now not every team is wearing their color rush jerseys this year. But they do like the Lions, I believe, aren't wearing them this year. But they do have them at least set up like a well, you know, like like I said, they do if though if you want to see your color rush jersey for your team, all you gotta do is go online, search color rush the apparently the Browns have a black jersey too, or at least a very, very dark a very dark dark brown. Never mind. And uh, a jersey that I actually liked a little bit more than I first gave it credit for was the gold offset kind of uh, gold and black Jacksonville Jaguars jersey from last year. So, cool one for the Chargers, all blue with the yellow numbers. A little bit different blue than normal, a little lighter than their normal dark kind of navy blue. But I'm pretty excited for the Steelers to wear theirs uh, as a fan. I'm sure a lot of fans will be excited. I believe the Steelers are wearing theirs on Thanksgiving or Christmas, whichever game it is. I believe they're playing the Ravens in which... That will happen. So um, if originally I heard it was the Colts. The one thing I did say earlier that the the teams are doing to avoid this problem they had with the fan those of uh, those of us fans um, out there the fans that are colorblind they will um, have the other team wear white. If that's the case, they're playing the Ravens. I don't know what they'll do there. Maybe one team wore the color rush and one other team won't. I'm not sure, but I'm very interested to see how this goes. I'm excited. Some of these jerseys are god awful. Seahawks, I'm talking to you. Some of these jerseys are pretty cool. Can't wait. But unfortunately, you guys are going to have to wait until tomorrow for any other news from here in the world of sports. I'd like to thank you guys for listening. Tomorrow, Ben will be back, and we'll be here to talk more news, everything that happens tonight in the world of sports. I'd like to remind you guys you can go to gsmcpodcast.com to find all of our shows. Ben does baseball with my football co-host, Jeremiah. Obviously, I just said I do football. I do soccer as well with Ben. So don't forget to check out those. Jeremiah will be starting the Fantasy Football Podcast soon, so keep an eye, ear out for those. Uh, as always, you can find us on Twitter, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Google Play. 
on Instagram and Twitter at GSMC, GSMC underscore sports, as well as on Facebook and YouTube at the GSMC Sports Podcast. I like to thank you guys for listening. For Ben, I am Alex, and I will see you guys tomorrow morning. Thank you for listening, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.